What is up, friends? So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite distributions in all of statistics and data science, the beta distribution. Now, truth is, I didn't learn about this distribution until kind of later in my journey through data science and machine learning. But once I did learn about it and I learned about the main application of the beta distribution, it quickly became one of my probably like top three distributions in all of data science. So if you agree after this video, let me know in the comments or just tell me what your top three distributions in all of data science are, but let's get right into it. So the fun example today is that you just started a probability course, so probability 101, and here's your super cool professor. It's three days into the course, so it's been Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and you've realized a very curious thing. You've realized that your professor only wears red shoes or blue shoes to class, so either red or blue. And so this question starts forming in your mind of, can I estimate, can I well estimate the probability that the professor would wear red shoes on any given day? So just a couple days in the course and based on some prior knowledge, the best you can do right now for estimating this probability is basically just look at the number of times in these three days that the professor has worn red shoes, which is just Monday and Tuesday, twice, divided by the total number of days that have gone by in the course so far, which is again, just these three days. So right now, your best guess, which we call this sample proportion, p hat r, is equal to 2 divided by 3, or about 67%. Now a couple more days go by in the course, and you learn about this thing called the error associated with this sample proportion. You learn that this thing is called a point estimate, just a single answer to that question of what's the probability the professor would wear red shoes. But you can actually do better. You can come up with a error, a standard deviation around this point estimate. And you learn that the formula to do so, this might seem familiar to some of you from previous courses. If not, don't worry, I'll explain the intuition here. You learn that the standard deviation is the square root of this sample proportion we just computed times one minus that sample proportion we just computed, all divided by the number of samples that that proportion is based on, which in this case is just three days so far. The main intuition in this formula is really in the denominator. So you see that as the denominator increases, so right now n is three, which is a pretty small number, but let's say 100 days have gone by in the course, that denominator would be 100. When the denominator of a fraction goes up, the entire fraction goes down, and in that case, in this case, the fraction is representing your error, which makes total intuitive sense. The more samples you have in calculating the sample proportion, the lower your error should be, and that totally all checks out. But for now, just observing three days, you see your error associated with this estimate of 67%. The error is about 27%, so a pretty big error, which is great in your estimation of probability because now you can tell someone, well, my best guess is 67%, but I'm gonna have to say that comes with an error of plus or minus 27%. So now whoever you tell this to has a much better understanding about what the situation is. But that kind of gets your gears turning. You say that, hmm, I've just learned that the main unit of probability in statistics is something called a distribution. And I used to have a point estimate. Now I have this interval estimate. Can I do better? Can I get a full distribution for estimating this probability? You're asking for a full distribution whose probabilities are going to help you have a best guess about a probability itself. And that's why a lot of times you'll see this kind of catchphrase about this beta distribution saying it's the probability of probabilities. Now that's not a very helpful phrase, but it is catchy. But basically what it's trying to say is that the beta distribution is a distribution that helps us model probabilities that we don't know about. It gives us the probability that a certain probability we're trying to estimate is at different values. Now that probably still seems extremely confusing because as I said it, I got confused too. And so let's continue on and see what that exactly means. So what we're saying is that I want a distribution who's going to satisfy these three requirements. Crucially, I need this distribution to only take positive mass or positive density between zero and one because this distribution that I would like to come up with is going to help me model a probability. And since it's going to help me model a probability, it doesn't make sense for this distribution to take any values less than zero or greater than one because probabilities can only be between zero and one. So that's requirement number one for whatever distribution I'm going to use to model this probability. The others are that I want the mean of this distribution, so the center of mass of this distribution, to be close to the sample proportion. 
And the intuition behind this is that, well, the sample proportion should continue being my best guess if I had to give someone a single answer to this question. And therefore, I would like that to be close to the mean of this distribution at the end of the day. Similarly, I would like the standard deviation of this distribution to be close to this empirical standard deviation, this standard error of the sample proportion that I came up with here. So I would like all this information I knew before to line up to be consistent with this distribution that I come up with now, which is gonna give me even more information about what this probability might be as the number of days in the course goes on. And so around the middle of the course, you finally learn about a distribution that meets all of these criteria, and that is exactly the beta distribution. So let's look at a couple examples of the beta distribution to understand how it actually works. The beta distribution is characterized by two parameters, alpha and beta. So alpha is gonna be consistently written in these red, in red here. So for example, in this beta distribution, here's alpha and beta is equal to two. Now, what do alpha and beta mean in the context of this problem and other problems that you would use the beta distribution for? Alpha is related to the number of successes in your problem and beta is related to the number of failures in your problem. Now these successes and failures are a very generic term that help you apply this to lots of different use cases. So you can find the right words in your domain. In this case, we're considering every time the professor wears red shoes as a success, because that's the probability we're trying to model. And we can consider every time the professor wears blue shoes, which is the other possibility, as our failures. So they're not exactly successes and failures, but you can see how they would match in the context of, for example, if we're using this to predict the probability that a team is gonna win a basketball game. In that case, the success and failure terminology would just be more spot on. But same idea here. So more specifically, alpha is the number of successes you've observed so far plus one. Okay, so alpha is the number of successes plus one, which makes sense why after three days, alpha is equal to three, because as we said, so far we observed the professor wearing red shoes two times, and two plus one is equal to three. Similarly, beta is the number of failures you've observed so far, plus one. So, so far after three days, we observed the professor wearing blue shoes one time, one plus one equals two. So that's how we got to, we're going to model the distribution of the probability the professor would wear red shoes after three days as a beta three, two distribution. Now the big question is, what does a beta three, two distribution look like? Well, it looks like this. So let me put a little bit more information here. So on the left axis here, we have zero. Over here, we have one. And so we see that that first criteria we wanted to meet is met. There is no mass of this distribution. There's no density of this distribution on the left of zero or to the right of one. So that first thing is met. Now we'll come back to whether our other two criteria about the mean being approximately equal to the sample proportion and the standard deviation being approximately equal to the standard error of the sample proportion. We'll come to that on the right panel here. But as a teaser for why things are looking good, if we calculate the mode of this distribution, so the mode of a distribution is just the peak, the highest point in the distribution, so that is where this gray dash line is. The mode of this distribution is 0.67, which is actually the sample proportion itself. So that makes us feel really warm and fuzzy inside that the most likely value of this distribution is actually the sample proportion, is the empirical proportion of times that the professor has worn red shoes. Now let's say 10 days have gone by in the course. So now let's say that the number of times the professor has worn red shoes is three, therefore alpha is equal to that plus one. So alpha is equal to four in this example. Let's say the number of times the professor wore blue shoes is seven, which is 10 minus three. And therefore beta is going to be that number of failures, seven plus one, which is eight. So now we have a beta four eight distribution. And you see that that looks like this. Again, makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside because the mode of this distribution is at 0.3, which is exactly the sampler proportion in this case of the number of times the professor wore red shoes. Now, the other thing I wanna note, the other thing that should make us feel warm and fuzzy inside is that after three days, our distribution looked like this. After 10 days, our distribution looks like this. Besides just the kind of general place the peaks are at, the other difference between these two distributions is that after 10 days, the standard deviation has gotten a lot smaller. You see that this distribution is a lot tighter around its peak than the distribution was after just three days. And that totally lines up with everything we know so far 
We know that as more and more days go by in the course, our distribution, whatever it is, should get tighter and tighter and tighter around the most likely value. Because we're just more certain after 10 days than we are after three days about our estimate being correct. And let's say now it's the last day of the course. It's day 100 of the course. You just took your final exam and you aced it. And you found that your final reading on the number of times the professor wore red shoes is 35. Therefore, if we take alpha as that plus one, we get 36. And the final reading of the number of times professor wore blue shoes is 65. So beta is 66 and we see that we have an even tighter distribution here. So we see the mode of this distribution is again the sample proportion of 0.35. And crucially, we see that the standard deviation has gotten even tighter than after 10 days. And if there was more days in the course, let's say we were on day like 1000 of the course or uh, even more than that, you would see that it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So the beta distribution seems to hit a lot of the intuitive conditions we would require out of a probability distribution who is trying to measure probabilities themselves. So hopefully it's more clear now what people mean when they say that the beta distribution is a probability of probabilities. That again is kind of a useless catchphrase, but it is cool to say, and I hope that it's a little bit more clear what's going on. Now let's go into some of the mathematical properties of the beta distribution. We kind of showed visually things make sense, but mathematically are things sane. The mean of the beta distribution which is different from the mode. So the mode is the peak, but if you look at this distribution, for example, the mean is going to be to the left of that because this distribution is skewed to the left, which is going to pull that mean to the left of the mode. The mean of the beta distribution is alpha over alpha plus beta. So in this case, it would be three divided by the sum of these two numbers, which is five, which is 0.6, which as we expected is to the left of 0.67. And so if we break down alpha and beta in terms of the actual number of times the professor wore red and blue, we get that the alpha is red plus one. Again, written down here, red plus one. And beta is blue plus one. Now, even though this isn't exactly r over r plus b, which is the mode, we see that as the sample size gets larger and larger, so as r and b get larger and larger, the limit that this approaches is exactly going to be r over r plus b, because these ones just become more irrelevant if you think back to your study of limits. As the variables r and b get larger and larger, these ones kind of, their influence vanishes and so the mean converges to the mode in that case. Looking at if the standard deviation also makes sense to us, the standard deviation, in this case actually variance formula, for the beta distribution looks a little complicated but we're gonna break it down about the same way. It's equal to alpha times beta divided by quantity alpha plus beta squared times quantity alpha plus beta plus one. What a mouthful, but we're gonna break it down the same way. I'm gonna take one term of alpha divided by one of these alpha over betas. That gives us reds plus one over reds plus blues plus two. I'm gonna take the beta and take the other term of alpha plus beta, which gives me blues plus one divided by reds plus blues plus two. And all that's remaining is a one divided by alpha plus beta plus one. By the way, what is alpha plus beta? Well, that's going to be the number of reds plus one plus the number of blues plus one. And there's another plus one here. So we have three plus ones total, so we get a three here. And all that's remaining is reds plus blues in the denominator. Reds plus blues is just the total number of days that have gone by because on any given day, it's either red or blue. So if I add up reds and blues, I get total number of days. So I just put N here for simplicity. Also because I was running out of space on the page. So hopefully that's clear there. Now, as complicated as this looks, we can do the same limit trick as we did before. So what does the variance approach as the reds and blues and N gets bigger and bigger? So the number of data points we observe gets larger and larger. Well, all these constants cancel out again. So this one becomes irrelevant, this two becomes irrelevant, same same, same, and so what you're left with is red over red plus blue, which is the sample proportion, times blue over red plus blue, which is one minus the sample proportion, all divided by n. If we look back to our understanding about the variance before we went into this whole beta distribution, we saw that it's sample proportion times one minus sample proportion, all divided by n, and we feel very good that that's exactly what we got here. Again, this is the variance, so you could just take the square root and it would look exactly like it did on the previous page. And that is it, folks. That is the beta distribution in a nutshell. 
The reason I think the beta distribution is so cool, one of my top distributions in all of data science, is that it is a distribution that helps us understand what value a probability itself might be. And therefore, it lends itself very well to the field of statistics and data science called Bayesian statistics. It lends itself to Bayesian statistics because in Bayesian statistics, we have some kind of prior of what we think a parameter might be. For example, in this problem, before observing any data at all, I would put equal probability that the probability the professor wears red shoes on any given day is between zero and one. It's just equally likely. I have no idea. I've never seen any data. But as Bayesian statistics goes, it takes this prior, and as you observe more data about the world, as three days go by, as 10 days go by, as 100 days go by, you're able to update that prior in intuitive ways in order to reflect your best understanding based on a combination of that prior and based on data you've observed in the real world. And that's why the beta distribution is just awesome, in my opinion. It really lends itself to the study of Bayesian statistics and understanding the study of uncertainty itself. So hopefully you agree. Hopefully you think the beta distribution is pretty cool. If you have any questions or comments at all, please feel free to post them below. Uh, thanks for watching this video. Like and subscribe for more just like this. I will see you all next time.